This is Down to Earth with Bruce Shutan, contributing journalist to One World Initiative, who has written for more than 120 publications, corporate entities, and individuals over nearly four decades. He also ghostwrites independently published business books and memoirs, and reports extensively on the American workplace for B2B trade magazines. Welcome to our program, which features interviews with leading newsmakers who address the most pressing issues of the day for our global audience. And now our host, Bruce Shutan. Hi, everybody. This is Bruce Shutan with One World Initiative. Our guest today is Chris Westfall, who is an author and business coach. Chris, it is such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, what attracted you to business and how did you get into the corporate world? Business was actually the last thing on my mind when I was growing up. I was, Bruce, when I was a kid, I was a performer. Uh, and I went to the High School for Performing Arts in Chicago and went on to have a bit of a career as, a, as an entertainer, you could say. I met my wife starring opposite her in a musical, if you can believe it. And uh, to the delight of listeners everywhere, I'm not going to sing today. I'm not going to. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I won't up... play drums today either. Oh, is that so? Are you a drummer? Ah, yeah. ah, there it is. There it is. Well, it's all music all the time. But anyway, I um, I grew up with a performer's mindset and um, ended up coming into business rather unexpectedly. I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I wasn't sure exactly how to go about it. And I had enjoyed some success as a, as a performer and as a sort of a media personality and on-camera talent. And I decided to go back to graduate school and get an MBA. And I worked my way through school performing in industrial films and commercials and things like that. And so it was a very sort of unexpected path into business. And the last job that I had before I went into the full-time MBA program was I worked as a professional stuntman professional stuntman, if you can believe it. Yeah. And by the way, I still do all my own stunts, uh, which you will see today. <laughs> but I I worked as a professional stuntman before I went back and got my MBA. I believe there's a guild for stuntmen uh, going back to my Hollywood press court days. Uh, is that correct? If you say so. I wasn't a stuntman long. I was, I was a stuntman long enough to live to tell the tale, but I certainly didn't make a career out of it. It was a short-lived sort of experience for me. Well, if I could pick up on what you were saying about that transition, what exactly turned you uh, from pursuing a career as a performer, kind of left brain, right brain, creative versus the business side of things and becoming an entrepreneur? It might be similar to, to your path. I don't know. I, I, I just knew that I wanted to go from being backstage in the green room to being in the boardroom. Mm. <laughs> That's what I wanted to, to do. I wanted to see what kind of contribution I could make um, instead of being on stage to, to create impact on a, on a new kind of stage. And, and to be a part of uh, the business world was something that always appealed to me. And I always found myself being drawn into these various projects that, that at first glance, I was like, this isn't, this isn't who I am. Mm -hmm. And I went through a bit of, of, I wouldn't call it an identity crisis, but maybe an identity identification mm -hmm. of having others see something in me that I didn't see in myself. And through, again, through the education that I pursued, I, I came to understand that I, because of my background, because of the creativity that had been a part of my background, I, in, in many ways, I had to work harder than a lot of people. But in, in other ways, some things came to me very easily. And so it was through this sort of dichotomy, this sort of balancing act between where I needed to work hard and to improve myself and, and capitalizing on the natural creativity and those gifts and those talents that I've been given, whatever those talents might be, I don't know, I'm, I'm using air quotes. I have no idea. But- It's but the performer that, in you. Correct, it's the performer, that's right. It's the performative air quotes. Um, but somewhere in between that, that performance background and the deep understanding of business that I gained, uh, a, a new identity emerged. 
And that's sort of the, the, I became the person that I, that I am today. And it was a, it's a journey. It's not like, you know, someone waved a magic wand and poof, I changed into someone who writes books and coaches people and works with fortune 500 companies. That's not how it happens. But over time, I grew into an understanding of really the easiest thing in the world to do. And, and that is to, to be who you are. And when I got comfortable with that, when I got comfortable with seeing not just myself through others' eyes, but really understanding who I, who I was as a person, which wasn't an ego exercise, it really wasn't. It wasn't about trying to pursue some uh, title on a business card or some address or some number in a bank account. It was really just getting comfortable with, with kind of letting life come through me and uh, letting that that creativity shine but letting it come through in the service of others and mm. that's really been the basis for for my my career and and recognizing that and stepping into that identity has not only been the easiest thing that i could do but it's also been the most fulfilling the most fulfilling thing i've ever done in my life so i want to talk a little bit about your book um mm. life seems to be more precarious than prior to the pandemic so in referencing the title of your book, how can we make things easier? Well, there was nothing easy about the pandemic and there's nothing easy about our current circumstances as we're coming out of it. And I, I won't make a laundry list of things that are challenging in life and society, relationships. We all have the things that we're dealing with, right? But for me, during the pandemic, I experienced a deep personal loss in addition to the loss of freedoms and all the things that were taken from all of us. But I experienced a deep personal loss and life became very difficult for me. And so from this place of a, a personal, just, just deep disappointment, I, I don't want to say tragedy, that feels a little grand, but it was really tough for me to deal with it with what, what happened. And I, what is it? I lost my father. I lost my father to COVID and he, mm -hmm. he passed away. Suddenly he tested positive on a Monday and by Friday he was gone. So oh. it was a very sudden yes. And it was in the early days of the pandemic. It was before masks and vaccines and all those kinds of things. Anyway. And uh, sorry for your loss too. A lot of people have gone through this. I mean, last time I checked more than 6 million people around the world, more than a million in the United States alone, those numbers are staggering. And so this tragedy mm -hmm. has affected so many of us, you included. Indeed. Indeed. And, and even if we weren't touched by tragedy during the pandemic, again, we all, we've all experienced that, that, that sense of loss, that sense of having things taken away, that sense of frustration. And now, uh, as we're sort of on the backside of this pandemic, new frustrations have emerged. And the thing that I have recognized in my life is that difficulty is always a constant. Life is not easy, but I have discovered through my own experience, and it's the experiences that I share in the book, that there is a way to show up that makes things easier. Now, and I'm being very careful about the words that I'm choosing here because the circumstances are the circumstances. The relationship is the relationship, but the way we show up is what is creating the world around us. And we always have a choice about how we choose to show up. And I wrote this book, not only because it's the book that I needed to write, but it's the book that I need to read. It's a book that for me is filled with a message of healing. And it's, it's not a, a sermon, it's not in your face, it's a story. It's a story of two guys who go on a journey, a journey through conversation and discovery to find a new way of approaching the difficulties of life. And, and the book, Easier, is actually filled with, with difficulty, just like life is. But in the midst of difficult circumstances, difficult relationships, misunderstandings, communication challenges, a, a new path emerges, a new possibility emerges. And, and that's the thing that shows up for me, Bruce, is that there are always possibilities, but we lose sight of that. We lose sight of the fact that, that in, in any situation, we can stop and ask ourselves, what can make this easier? But mm -hmm. when we're stressed, when we're up on our heads, when we're lost in thought, we don't see that as a possibility. We see that there's only one way forward, and it looks like a brick wall, and it involves other people who are impossible to work with. You know, as Nelson Mandela said, it seems impossible until it's done. 
And I could tell you story after story of things in my life that looked absolutely impossible, and yet they are done. And here we are. And not the least of which is coming through the pandemic. But there are we all have stories like that of things that we have overcome. And easier is a story to help people to to find resilience, to find to find the transformation inside of that of that frustration by showing up differently and stepping into a place where new possibilities exist. What are some of these scenarios that you address in the book that uh, uh, you offer advice up on how to make life easier in the face of this adversity? And maybe some of the commonality that you, you saw uh, emerge through the pandemic when people were wrestling uh, a little bit harder with life's challenges? Mm. Well, when I originally set out to write this book, I was going to write it as a hundred ways to, you know, create the future of work was what originally I started to write. And when I got into it, I said, this, this feels like a hundred blog posts. And I just don't want to do that. What would happen if I, if I created a story? What would happen if instead of blog posts that this was a conversation? And this is the book that emerged. It's a conversation between a client and a coach. The client hires the coach because he's frustrated with his job. He's not able to make an impact. He, he thinks he might want to quit. He thinks he might want to start his own business, but he's not sure. He doesn't have the confidence to know what to do next. So he hires the coach to help him to find a path forward. Little does he know that he's going to be fired in just five days. Mm. So from this beginning emerges this life after career death story, this reemergence, if you will, of what's on the backside of an unexpected ambush, a, a circumstance that, that leaves the client not, not just surprised, but, but basically destitute without the thing that was his identity, which was his job. And so back to your question of what, what can I share to, to help people? The, the story unfolds around these circumstances to help us and to help the reader, hopefully, to see that new possibilities always exist. And as I mentioned before, and if you think about it, you say, well, new possibilities exist. What is this mumbo jumbo? What exactly, how many possibilities exist? Well, think about it. How many possibilities exist right now for us in this interview? I mean, I can say, I could say anything. I could say avocados. I could say Justin Bieber. I could say Canada. I could say anything. And, and so can you. And if that's true for us in this interview, that we can say anything, we, we have unlimited possibilities but we lose sight of that. And so what can people do to help to regain those possibilities? And, and from an understanding that possibilities always exist, a sense, of, a sense of agency, a sense of influence in our lives. How do we, how do we find that? Well, the couple of things that I would share first is zoom out. When we zoom in on our lives and we think that life is something to be managed and figured out what happens is, things get more difficult because, because we experience tunnel vision. Life, it looks like there's only one way to win. I mean, imagine, imagine an athlete in any, any sport, pick the sport, doesn't matter, but an athlete comes to the coach and says, coach, there's only one way to win. The coach says, sit down. Your job is to find every way to win. But we lose sight of that because, because we get so focused on what it is that we want or what it is that's missing. And we don't have an opportunity to step back, to zoom out, to see that what we're going through is part of the human condition. And from this place of understanding, and particularly in the, in the book, it, it really illustrates how from a place of understanding, we can find a new way of showing up. And zooming out is the first, the first step. Another, another step that can help this is counterintuitive in the world that we live in today, the go, go, go world that we live in. But here it is, two words again, slow down, slow down. You know, John Wooden, the famous UCLA basketball coach, he said, be quick, but don't hurry. And when we, when we slow down, whether we're talking about enjoying a meal or enjoying our partner or spouse, or just enjoying life, slow down can help you to see things in, in a new way. 
And that's part of the experience that the coach and the client go through is the coach is able to create a space for the client where things do slow down and he does see things differently and he does see new opportunities and new possibilities, but the book's not tidy. It doesn't have a, doesn't have a Hollywood ending because, because life is not tidy. Life is messy. Life is messy. And as the client thinks he's found his way towards a new opportunity, that opportunity is taken away from him again. Chris, my favorite movies are the ones that don't have a Hollywood ending mm. because you kind of expect that. And I like to expect the unexpected. Um, your book in the style uh, in which it's presented reminds me a lot of my favorite business book, which is The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, sure. uh, which is just a wonderful story that is told through composite characters who are clients. And so it gets me to, to thinking, how do you help people tell their stories when you're uh, coaching them as a, as a business coach and certainly uh, an author? Um, you and I both know the value of that narrative storytelling uh, in business and mm -hmm. how you're able to get an edge. So I'm curious to have you weigh in on that. One of the clients that I'm working with right now is a publicly traded company in the UK. So they're on the FTSE. They're based in, in London and also a small town called Corby in, uh, in England. But I have been working with their leaders, in fact, with the entire organization on this idea of storytelling. And the first question that comes up before you get into the tactics of storytelling and what makes an effective story is, is always, when does storytelling make sense? Because if you just need Trevor to go to the supply closet and bring you a sticky note, you don't really need a story around that. But during times of, of change, of transformation, of I'll even say upheaval, which I think describes uh, in, in many ways the business climate that we're in right now. Storytelling is the key to helping people to navigate through change. And when there are times of transition, helping people to understand as leaders that we've been there before or that we've seen things like this before can be a source of comfort. But the fact of the matter is nobody can predict the future. And saying we've been here before means experiencing the same feelings before, but we've never been in this period of time exactly ever before. And no one can predict the future. And you say, Chris, you're filling the conversation with uncertainty. <laughs> But my story is not one of uncertainty. My story is one of understanding. And my understanding is this. Human beings have an innate ability to figure things out. It's part of our DNA. And the stories that we need to be sharing and telling are stories of resourcefulness and innovation to help others to tap into that same level of innovation. And you say, well, Chris, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, it's by sharing stories that reflect an understanding of the way the world works. For example, and let me just give you a quick example. You can't enter a river at the same place twice. What I mean by that is that if I say to you, I entered a river at this point right here by this rock, and I stepped on this rock, and then this is how I entered the river. If you go to do that at a different place in time, it's a different river. But here's what I know. One, the story of my experiences can help you to shape your own. Two, you're a smart guy and you know how to figure things out, <laughs> which is not, I'm not trying to butter you up. I'm just saying as human beings, we, that's part of our DNA. It's like five fingers on a hand. We all have that capacity. And the third thing that I know is, is we have the capacity to plan and we have the capacity to adapt. So through that combination of adapting and planning, we face the future. And for leaders who are listening to the sound of my voice, <laughs> consider stories of when you've come up against the unexpected and how you have tapped into new resources when things didn't go as planned. Because the stories I think that we need to be telling one another are stories of resourcefulness. And, and if you think about it, I mean, the movies that you love are stories of incredible resourcefulness in the midst of difficult odds, which I think is the story of all of us. Mm, no doubt. 
So to take this a little step further, um, you know, we seem to be having a major communication problem in this country. And I'm wondering, first of all, how you think we can communicate better? And secondly, um, I'd love your thoughts on social media and how that helps us to communicate better or worse and what advice you would give someone uh, in terms of using social media to try to advance their career. Well, let me take the second question first, which is sure. how can we use social media? You know, what's what are the advantage of it, advantages of it? If I understand, is that the, is that the question? The second one that you asked in there? Yeah. Social media, it is what it is. It's like Chris. What what would you do if it's raining outside? The answer is grab an umbrella. So social media is the online world, and so, in my opinion, there is no opt out. <laughs> For social media, we we have to participate uh, as leaders um, and to share ourselves. Sharing ourselves online is part of that. So it's a very important question that you ask. How do we take the time to shape that story? And the story that in business is, for me, the one that is most compelling is the story about the person that always matters most. And for me as a keynote speaker, I do a lot of keynotes. I'm up in front of groups and doing Zoom presentations, all that kind of stuff. One of the things that I've learned is that when I am in front of the audience, the most important person in the room, it's never me. It's always the audience. And so in terms of social media, and I, I claim to be no guru or no expert. I'll just say that as a caveat right up front. But to me, what looks like the most valuable message to share is one of service. And when you look in the direction of service, you look in the direction of who you wish to serve and how you can serve them. And the value that you create is going to be equal to the amount of shares and likes and responses that you receive. So, and I don't know if you're looking for more, more of a tactical answer, but I think strategically looking at social media, I would say, look in the direction of service. And I think that also goes back to your very first question, which is what is missing in our communication? So many times our communication is self-serving. So many times we speak in first person, which is I, me, my, or first person plural. Mm -hmm. Hard to spit that one out. Sorry about that. First person plural, which is we, us, and our. Well, what happens when you make the second person first? Second person is you. And I don't mean you specifically, but I mean you, the person that you wish to reach, the person that you wish to connect with. And when we are able to say things such as, I hear you, I see you, our communication becomes more powerful because we are, as Stephen Covey says, we're beginning with the end in mind. We are making the listener, the audience, the most important person. And so many times I do communication coaching and people say, well, I ramble. I tend to go on and ramble and stuff like that. And I say, well, here's, here's, do you know how to stop rambling? And they go, no, I don't know how to stop rambling. That's why I'm asking you. And I said, well, here, it's pretty simple. You just stop. They're like, can it really be that simple? I said, try it sometime. And if you don't believe me, stop and ask this question. Have you ever been there? Can you relate to that? Absolutely. And you know what I'm saying? So that you see what people are, where people are. I think, I think the three most powerful words in business today are I hear you. To say that in a sincere way, not in some perfunctory check the box or we're listening. <laughs> we're doing what we want, but we're listening. Mm, that doesn't feel authentic. And that doesn't feel like a dialogue. Mm. And the best, the best social media, in my opinion, like the best conversation is always a dialogue. To <clears throat> take what you just said a step further, it seems like empathy was the watchword early on in the pandemic when we were all thrust uh, together in this situation in lockdown and that in the business world in particular, um, there was a call, a widespread call for empathy across all organizations from management to be more empathetic to employees employees among one another and back up the chain to management as well. Um, how would you assess where we are now with that? And, uh, you know, which kind of companies um, and executives in particular that you uh, 
uh, may want to tip your cap to that you think are more productive today and what kind of qualities uh, help them uh, to get there? I think empathy is an important asset. And again, it's not just something that is, is part of a diversity inclusion initiative or, or some other initiative. It, it seems to me that empathy needs to be woven into the very fabric of business. There's a curious disconnect, I think, between uh, what, what uh, government is doing, uh, which seems to be, a, 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 in many regards, a lack of empathy. And in business, we see an emphasis on empathy. empathy. In business, we say that this idea of uh, control command and control is an outdated concept. And yet so many times in government, that's that's what we're experiencing. And it's a very strange time right now. So I, I'm not a political guy and I don't want to go any deeper into that matter other than to just notice that there's a difference between understanding and controlling. There's a difference between instructing and inspiring. And for leaders who wish to create an impact, Consider that without understanding another perspective, your own is not truly informed. And if you wish to instruct, maybe you don't need to be informed of other people's, other people's viewpoints, excuse me. But if you're not informed around other people's viewpoints, if you don't take your audience into consideration, where are you trying to take your audience? You see, I think back to what Arthur Ashe famously said, Arthur Ashe, the great tennis pro, he said, start where you are, do what you can, never give up. And I think that the leaders in any business or in any organization who are going to have the greatest impact are the ones who understand where people are first and foremost. And from this understanding, which is another way of saying empathy, but, but understanding another person's point of view informs your own. And from this informed place, making decisions to help create greater retention among employees, to help them to understand that, that your organization is the organization of choice. I'm fortunate. I have, I have a number of companies that I work with who are, who are doing this. One, in fact, in, in your neck of the woods, an organization that's, that's based there in Salem, Oregon, that is creating a coaching culture. So traditional roles that might be called office manager or something like that, those, those roles have been renamed as, as coaches. And you say, well, is that, just, is that just semantics? Are you just, you know, a rose by any other name? What are you trying to do here? But it's, it's not just a change in title. It's a change in philosophy. Because coaching does a couple of things for an organization. One, it creates a culture that says, I see you, I hear you. I start where you are, as Arthur Ashe said. And from there, not making management into a curriculum or an agenda or a one-size-fits-all solution is, to me, the hallmark of an organization that is adaptable and an organization that is co-creating, if you will, the future, rather than having folks in an ivory tower somewhere looking into crystal balls and telling people which way <laughs> the wind blows. I know there's a lot of mixed metaphors in there. I apologize. But you know what I'm saying? People in a, and they say, you know, in the ivory tower saying, you know, this is, this is the way we're marching forward. Well, it, is it? Do you really, have you really captured the hearts and minds of your employees? And I know you asked me on the back end of that, of, of organizations that are, that are getting this right. And uh, some of the companies that, that I'm working with, uh, again, I, I don't, I don't want to name names, but there's, there's this impulse, and it's it's not about naming famous names. It's about what is the impulse on the inside of your organization? Are you creating a culture that is based on command and control, or is it a culture that says, you know what, genius isn't just something that's reserved for the select few in the C-suite. Genius, wisdom, we all have the ability to access these things. I'm not saying that everyone's a genius. But we've all experienced moments of genius. We all have the ability to have insights, even kids. I mean, you know, there are six-year-olds, sometimes they pop off and I go, where did you think of that? It's extraordinary. I think of my own kids, some of the things that they said in childhood is extraordinary. My point is not that we should all pipe off like children, but <laughs> that we all have the ability to have insights and we all have stories to tell. We all have insights to share. And leadership is about a lot of things, but it, ultimately it's about sharing your vision. 
And that vision starts with your story and being able to capture what matters to you. And one of the things that I said to my coaching clients um, who are based uh, not just in Salem, but they're in various other locations, Kaiser, Corvallis, uh, different locations there in, in your neck of the woods. And I said to them as coaches, I said, when you are working with your team, don't solve anything. And they looked at me like I had lost my mind. I said, no, don't solve. Don't solve problems. Relate to problems. Share how you faced a similar problem. And then step across the desk and co-create the solution. Help the person in front of you to take ownership of the solution. Don't you solve. Because if you are carrying the, the can for the person whose job it is to achieve a certain task, you are not coaching them. You are not empowering them. You're becoming their crutch. You're, you're starting a game of mother may I. And that's what you will create is that every time there's a challenge, they play mother may I. Mother may I move forward. May I take this step? May I? No, no, no. That's not empowerment. Empowerment is understanding how ownership works and you give that ownership to people. So again, maybe it is crazy. Maybe it's, it's, it's lunacy, but don't solve other people's challenges. Why? Because their answers come from one place and one place only, and that's inside of them. And without that empathy and without that understanding, what are you going to be doing? You're just going to be passing out advice and instructions and telling people how to live their lives and do their jobs. And if, if that's what the world looks like to you, then I, I suspect my voodoo won't, won't help you. But if you want to create an, an organization that harnesses the mental horsepower of every employee, every person in the organization, consider what it is that you're trying to solve and what might happen if you change the conversation what might happen if you give people an opportunity to find their own solutions and trust in them that they can? Chris, one final question in our remaining minutes, and that is two years ago, uh, there were nearly 50 million Americans who applied for unemployment uh, benefits. Uh, 10 months later, we had the start of something called the Great Resignation where uh, in the past year, uh, around the same number of people uh, who I had just referenced uh, had quit jobs yeah. the, in 2021. Uh, at some month, in some months, more than 4 million people have quit. There are more than 11 million jobs open right now. Given that backdrop, what kind of advice would you give to a young person entering into the workforce today under these circumstances? And of course, uh, the workplace is changing. Uh, we have remote work, hybrid, nine to five as we once knew it. Um, it is not quite the same. And post pandemic, it, it's probably gonna be a completely different ball game. It's a different ballgame. You just said it there. For folks that are looking at the workforce and looking at the statistics that you've mentioned, it seems clear to me that there's no one size fits all answer. That the answer is not start your own business or go get a job. There's not one size fits all. And I can't sit here and say which is better, which is worse. Each individual, each person has to decide. And so really your question is about how do you decide which path forward is best? And for some folks, taking a job and, and working for another company is the answer. And for others, uh, starting their own business. But which is better? It's, it's sort of like saying, what's your favorite kiss? <laughs> no, how to pick one out and single it out. And for me, I've... I've worked in organizations, I've worked for Fortune 100 companies, and I've owned my own business. And there have been challenges and difficulties and wonderful things in both of those environments. The thing that you have to remember is that everywhere you go, there you are. And when you look in the direction of the service that you want to provide, as well as the kind of lifestyle that you want to create for yourself, what happens if 
if you zoom out and look at it with a certain degree of neutrality. And let me explain what I mean by neutrality. If I think that working for myself is something that's glamorous and sexy, and I want to call myself an entrepreneur. In fact, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to create YouTube videos. I want to make a million dollars a year and have thousands of followers, hundreds of thousands of followers, millions of followers. And I'm doing that because it looks sexy. I'm doing that for the wrong reasons. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have hundreds of thousands of millions of followers. There's nothing wrong with what I just described. There's nothing wrong with starting your own business. But where things get tricky is if we look like, if, if the world looks like there's only one way to win. And my question to someone in this situation as a coach would be, what else could this be? And, and who would you need to be to create the world that, that you'd like to live in? Whether that is a world where you're creating YouTube videos and living as an entrepreneur and an influencer, or maybe where you're doing something that, that is perhaps less glamorous. My point is not which jobs are more glamorous and which ones aren't. My point is, is that you have to be true to yourself, not to some external. And the reason I say this, Bruce, is because there have been times in my life where I've had a pile of money in the bank and I've been miserable. There have been times in my life where I've been poor and I've, been, I've never been happier. And when we think that it is externals that create our world, that's a simple misunderstanding. We process our world from the inside out. Our externals, it looks like our externals are what, what we need, right? We're chasing that address. We're trying to put the kids in that, that fancy school because then we'll be happy. Mm. How's that working? In my experience, the, the chase, the pursuit of those externals is where you will never find that thing that you're looking for. And I'm talking about happiness. I'm talking about ease. I'm talking about just being comfortable in your own skin. Because when, when things are easier and you're comfortable in your own skin, well, you can launch a YouTube channel. You can, <laughs> you can apply for that job. You can ask for a promotion. You can step into the person who you were meant to be. And that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from, from George Eliot, who said, it's never too late to be who you might have been. And for me, this is, this is a theme that seems much more powerful than chasing some external. Is when we reflect back on who we are and the identity, the service that we can provide, the identity that's not an ego exercise, the identity that shows up after this question, who are you when you are not on your mind? From that place, and that's not some Zen riddle, for, that is a place of that egoless understanding of who we are and what, what kind of life is trying to come through us. And maybe that life shows up on a YouTube channel. Maybe it shows up at the factory or in the office or, or as a first responder or whatever that career is. See, the thing that, is, that I think is so screwed up is, is that we think that some contributions are, are more, more impressive than others. And that's a misunderstanding. The contribution that you make that is most satisfying to you, there's no other choice. There's, there's nothing that will be more satisfying. And I think that that's, again, I don't know if that's the answer that you're looking for or the people listening are, are looking for, but I think that it is a journey to find ourselves in order to find that next role or starting that next business. That's been my experience anyway, because I've chased a lot of neon rainbows. I've chased a lot of, uh, of so-called goals. And one of the things that I take my clients through is we do a little exercise where we look at the goal line, what it is they're trying to achieve. Then we look at something else. We look at the goal line and what it is that they want to be. Because at the end of the day, you're a human being, not a human doing. Mm -hmm. And it is that being that leads to the real source. In my experience and in the experience of the clients that I work with, that who you are, and how you are showing up is what creates the world around you. I mean, you get clear on who you are. It, it doesn't matter whether you're an entrepreneur, you're launching a YouTube channel, you're working at the factory, 
or you're, you're helping to heal the sick at the local hospital. All of those things are valid, valuable, and more. I guess really what I'm talking about is, is finding your purpose. And that purpose to me, as specific as I can be about it, is service. And I would also add to it creativity, which isn't arts and crafts, <laughs> but, but the process of creation. What is it that you are creating? And I'll tell you something else. This, this brings up an important point. One of the things that I talk to my, my clients about regarding storytelling. When it comes to storytelling, there's two types of language that I've discovered. And you go, Chris, there's hundreds of languages on earth. No, I'm not talking about different languages. I'm talking about the way that we use language. One is the language of description, which is like white papers, news reports. It's what you find in college lecture halls. It's the language of description, describing something. But in business, there's another kind of language that we can use, and we, we can use it in all aspects of life, actually, and it is the language of creation. The language of creation talks about agreements. The language of creation talks about innovation. The language of creation talks about building something together. It's based on collaboration. It's a language that focuses on opportunity. It is a language that is compelling, not just informational. And when it comes to storytelling, when it comes to careers, when it comes to life choices, one of my first questions is, what is it that you are trying to create for yourself? Not what is it that you're trying to control? Not what is it that you're trying to manage? Not what number are you chasing in your bank account? But what is it that you are creating? That to me is, I think, the most powerful question. Chris, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And um... Best of luck moving forward. People pick up this book. You'll be inspired. I know I will. All the best to you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Appreciate it.